of relief last section of the day um, so this one's probably the most important aspect apart from the administration which you needed to know about uh, this is about the innovation process so what I'm going to give you now is a, a process that you and your group can perhaps follow and adapt throughout uh, this term uh, there are very uh, quite a few different variations of uh, design processes and innovation processes so take it with a pinch of salt uh, but sometimes it's very good to plan your milestones, communicate with your group which stages you're in at the moment or which stages you're working on and what your goals you're working towards. Um, just some research that I've done in this area, I've, I've done some quite substantial work in the development of design processes. Uh, here's one of the reviews uh, I conducted, um, which was, I think, uh, 50... Uh, different main authors from engineering design, how they perceive the engineering design process. Um, and it turns out that they pretty much all cover the same stages. So there's a hell of a lot of agreements between the different authors and how they perceive the design process. Um, so really what we can take is the, uh, the top... Uh, uh, yeah, this top process here. Uh, by Parle and Bites as a, a general template. Uh, so one of the conclusions uh, we drew was uh, basically process models like assholes. They've all got one, but they don't want to see each other's. Um, but there are some genuine innovations, the term used loosely there, uh, in the development of um, design, engineering design process models. And one of them was the introduction of the stage gate by Cooper. Um, and this is much more of a management process, where it's saying you should have a stage and it should be followed by a gate. And the gate should have very rigorous decision-making uh, policies in it. So at each gate, you need to get rid of a number of concepts and you need to decide on a direction. And it might be to kill the project completely, but once you decide on that direction, you should have a very, very good reason to having to pass back through the gate for another iteration. In other words, once you go through that gate and make a decision, you carry on with it. Um, so here's some of the typical stages you'll have. Uh, initial screen, the ideation, which is where you guys are at now. You're producing your three business ideas. You'll get together next Friday and you'll, you'll have a gate meeting where you'll say, have some reason to reject some of them and push ahead with others. And maybe you'll spend the first week or two pushing ahead a couple of business ideas and taking them to their logical conclusion. Does one of them open up better opportunities than another? Uh, you have a preliminary investigation, um, a second gate, and so on, and you can follow the development. There's other models. Uh, this is the Scrum model. It's an agile product development model, which is becoming very popular amongst um, management consultants. It's mainly used in the software development industry. Um, again, the rugby metaphor. It's not the reason I chose it this time. Um, but the Scrum model is essentially saying you specify particular requirements that you're going to focus on. And you hope to give actual rewards very early on. So you don't look at the whole picture, you focus on giving early, quick and early rewards and then iterating through the requirements so you're always getting rewards throughout the process rather than spending a long time with nothing, hoping for a complete holistic solution and then realising halfway through you've, the requirements have changed, you need to change your overall holistic solution. That's where the Agile model comes in. Uh, but the one we're going to use is the double diamond uh, model. Or, sorry, you're welcome to use whichever process you like. Um, but the one I'm going to propose to you is this double diamond process uh, proposed by the Design Council. And this was basically created on a descriptive study of lots of different uh, companies. One was Lego, funnily enough, um, on how they do their product development. And based on all this data, they created this double diamond process. And it essentially works in, you have your problem at the beginning, you then diverge, and each one of these is supposed to represent ideas. 
So the first thing you do when you have the problem, you look at all the related areas to the problem, all the other associated problems, all the other associated opportunities. And that's in the discover phase. Then you hit the define phase where you decide, OK, now we've got to make sense of all this. We've got to get rid of some of them. We've got to combine some of them. And we've got to focus on a particular problem area. And out of that comes your problem definition or your mission statement. You then go into a develop phase where you now have a specific mission that you're looking for. You start developing your technology or your solution to do it and the different ways or the different types of solutions that can fulfill that problem. Then you get to this stage and you have to converge again and say, OK, which ones of these solutions are viable? Which ones do we need to combine? And then you end up at your final solution. So essentially, the process I'm proposing is you have a divergent phase, a convergent, a divergent, and a convergent. You can take it a little bit further. You might realize that you need, you need to uh, do another diamond onto the end of it. And Stuart Pugh proposes something similar, which is this controlled convergence process, uh, which basically you spend the whole way through just slowly uh, diverging and then converging a little bit more each time. But we're going to start off with uh, going through this in each, uh, each of its phases now. Where do we start uh, in this process? So where you are right now, when you're thinking of business ideas, are you starting with a problem? Is it always a problem that the innovation process begins with? No. no. I'd agree. But a lot of things often start up by people getting an idea and of the solution, sometimes even. Okay. Or, or even starting up by seeing that the, maybe they have to collaborate in the potential afterwards. Mm -hmm. So maybe you, you think about, hey, there is a potential here, and now it defines the problem. That's a good point. So the answer here is basically no. Uh, sometimes you start with a potential solution or a, a promising idea um, and then you may work towards developing whether it really makes sense or not. So there's generally two types. It's either market driven where you realize there's a real need in the market and you start developing a product to cater for that need or it's technology driven where you have a good idea for a technology which might be useful for a product and you have to establish a market for it. So those, roughly speaking, are the two. Do you think there's a, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering whether there's any other potential routes to uh, innovation? I, I put it as an open question. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I often tend to, when I am in certain environments, and you have a critical state of mind, you, uh, you tend to be critical about the products and the things that are around you. And therefore, you will often <coughs> see other issues regarding the problem, maybe optimizing, and that will not be even a radical innovation, but more um, an improvement, but a radical one. Okay. So, I think maybe incremental. Also there's an important note to, to make to uh, differentiate between, well, sometimes you see someone coming up with a process, for instance, that's much better than the existing process. So, is that technology driven or is that market driven? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason for the existing process, the reason for it actually being there is probably because someone is actually making money on that process. So that in itself would be a market-driven uh, well, uh, idea, uh, not a technology-driven idea, because someone else is actually doing the market stuff for you in that sense. So that's also like a, an industry kind of thing, you might say. So that might be just taking advantage that you could perhaps do better than the competition in a given market. Um, I can see that. Um, so really, I think this is slightly flawed. It shouldn't really be starting with a problem. Uh, where do we start? A problem, technology, market need. Maybe it's a brand. Maybe you have a great idea for a brand and you want to leave a, some value. Think of which areas you can take the brand into. A new process, a service. Uh, but what I'd suggest is 
you're starting with an idea that provides an opportunity to capture value. Uh, hopefully, roughly speaking, that, that encapsulates all of your business ideas on Friday. Tell me now if, uh, if you don't think it does quite. Okay, so it's basically an opportunity. You take that opportunity and you go through the discover phase, thinking up as many opportunities as possible, developing them and combining them. So I listed on the website, if you haven't seen it already, lots of sources of inspiration where you might find societal challenges. We also have um, uh, DTU Photonics patents listed there where you can take those patents and exploit them um, and develop services on top of them. Um, there's areas for funding, there's some great ideas from IDO, but it's called Open IDO, but there might be some copyright uh, issues there. So just if you're going to take from there, make sure you, you look into it properly. Um, but essentially, lots of sources of inspiration. It might just be your own creative thoughts or your own observations from society. And I think one, one more we could add there is that you've probably all recently done some kind of a project that you, uh, uh, and if you do a project at the DTU, there's probably a, a meaning to that. There's probably a reason you're doing that project. Maybe it's somewhere into a really sort of specific technological area or it's something that's very market-minded. But regardless of whether it's one or the other, it probably has some address, some application in a market uh, somewhere down the road. So think about that as well. It might even be like, you know, how I optimize uh, this silicon wafer for, uh, you know, new types of microelectronic, electromechanical devices, whatever. Something as specific as that, right up to you know a, a new way of producing a, a soccer ball. So think about that as well. There's probably a reason for uh, you doing those projects. So uh, think about them again. That's a good point. Um, during this phase, some of the other things you've got to consider once you've got your inspiration is work out where does the value reside. So what, what aspect of your proposal, of your business idea, has the value and how can you capture it? How much is it worth and to who? Uh, what's the possibility for expansion? So maybe the route in, the initial idea, isn't much, but maybe it's the, the follow-on process that might be worth something. I look at uh, Spotify at the moment and I think when they, they first got onto market, the initial phase really isn't that useful for them. It's not a, um, it's kind of not really a very good market move, but they knew as soon as they get a critical mass of people involved, producing enough playlists, getting locked into the technology, they'll really uh, basically have, have enough dominance in that area. I, I suspect they'll, um, they'll be sending uh, iTunes, well, pretty much under in terms of their, the profit iTunes generates. Maybe you disagree. Uh, but in other words, look for possibilities for expansion. It might not be that first uh, entrance to market, but it might be the second or the third that has the real value. What are the future trends of the technology market and users' behavior? So look around you. You might notice uh, products and technologies, uh, people's behaviors or behavioral patterns around you moving in a slightly different direction, maybe that's going to produce an opportunity. What products and services result from social, economic and legislative or environmental change? Um, and a couple of tools that you can use are uh, Brainstorm, I, I guess you've already used that several times, and Mind Maps, very useful for this divergent phase because instead of just brainstorming down one route and one area, you get to make sure you spread your ideas across a whole plethora of different business opportunities. So it may be that on your first, uh, on your first meeting, you try to create a mind map based on all of your um, business ideas to begin with and see where they develop to. And then, of course, your, your goal will be to build on and perhaps uh, combine opportunities. So here's an example of a mind map. Uh, this is for a mind map for the topic of time man management. But the idea is when you send out these different branches, it encourages you to di uh, diverge along different solutions 
rather than converging along one solution. We then have the defined phase, rejecting less valuable opportunities and refining the formulation of the promising ones. So this is a, a really great list. In terms of your um, uh, defining what your problem you're solving or what your actual opportunity is, uh, this is a great list for the product or service or technology you might be looking at. A whole list of questions help you define your problem. We've also, on the business side of things, got a, a quick and dirty approach to evaluate business opportunities in this phase. Uh, that's going to be presented by Jakob now. Which one was it? This one, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Thomas and I have talked about uh, what do you actually do when you, you get an idea? How do you, how do you uh, handle that idea? How do you push forward? And the first part that's that's very important to make is that before you start talking to investors, before you start talking to your boss, before you start talking to, well, anyone else and the immediate, your immediate surroundings. Yeah, Sorry. Is your microphone on? Yes, sir. Okay, so it's cool? Great. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Well, before you start talking to uh, anyone else, maybe you should uh, you know, uh, have a, you know, a, a, a method for yourself uh, to, uh, to evaluate these ideas. And what I came up with is essentially what I call a, a quick and dirty guide to killing your darlings because uh, we're all uh, very, probably very uh, used to having a lot of different ideas that when it comes to, uh, you know, when you look, delve deep, deeper into them, it, it, you find out that they're kind of not all that viable and maybe not that attractive to the market. So um, this is such an important step. This is something that you need to have in your mind at all times. This is something that I, I, I try to do this framework for myself. What, what do I do when I come across a new idea? I have a lot of friends and they always, we always sit at, uh, around the table discussing ideas. So what do we need to look into? Um, and I have these three points. Uh, who's my first customer? Uh, the number of customers, of course. The market size, is it attractive? And of course, again, I have to stress that I come from a, a venture uh, point of view. I'm used to uh, building companies, or at least the company I've been involved with is about you know, making money and actually selling as much as, as, as possible. Um, so that's, that's uh, primarily what this list is aimed at. Um, and how do I get there? And actually, who do I need uh, to get there? Uh, well, the first one, well, I'll, I'll start up with, the, with the, the perfect idea. And if any of you have an idea that complies to this, get out of here and just get, get going with it because then you're in the wrong place and you'll be a much wealthier man than me or woman uh, very soon. Um, first of all, um, the idea is a need to have the customer simply can't do without this idea. It's like air, they have to, some, they have, to have something to breathe, so they have to buy your product. That would be good. Um, there's a huge market. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, that's interesting because then we can sell a lot of products, a lot of services, and it's fully scalable. Going from Denmark or going from Copenhagen to Denmark to the rest of the world is as easy as anything. Uh, that would probably be something like a web app or uh, something internet-based if, if that's, that's to be possible. It's a one size fits all. So if I sell it to you or if I sell it to you, I don't have to change the product. I don't have to customize it. It's, it'll work in, in either case. Um, it's free to produce. Uh, I can make this product and sell it and I, the 100% of the, the value is, uh, is what I earn. So that would be nice as well. Uh, there's no risk in execution. Uh, there's a you know, clear road going to success. Uh, no obstacles on the way. Um, and uh, I just need to get started. And by the way, it's ready tomorrow because uh, the, te the technology is already there and I have it here in my hand. Um, it's a lot better and a lot cheaper than the existing solutions and it's impossible to replicate. So I have 
I'm sh I see a lot of you're all still sitting here, so I suppose that uh, none of you have this idea. So, but uh, but let's get into uh, sort of the more realistic uh, dimension of it. Um, well, first of all, this whole thing about uh, who's going to buy my project product, of course that's important. Whenever you design something, whenever you do something, you have to be conscious of what am I actually trying to realize here? Is it a social end? Is it uh, a financial end? Is this something that's supposed to make me money, my company money, or someone, some other stakeholder money? And in doing so, you have to figure out who's actually going to pay the money. That would be uh, the customer or maybe uh, another company that could also be the customer. Um, and when you've found this customer, you need to figure out, so is it only one type of customer or are there several different types of customers? For instance, um, am I selling to students in Denmark? Uh, and am I selling to students in general in Denmark, uh, or sorry, students in general in the world, or is it only students at the technical university, or is it only students at CBS? Things like that you have to be aware of because the students at DTU don't necessarily buy for the same reasons as the students at CBS. So you have to think, figure things like that out. And the reason for that is, um, well, the, it's not the next point, but it's the next uh, one down again. The reason for that is, for you to make the perfect product to a certain customer, to a certain segment that is within the, the market, uh, you have to make it uh, absolutely adapted to the needs of this customer. It would be very nice if this, it would be very good if this product was a need to have product, meaning it's like air and it's not like scented air or whatever, something that would be nice to have, cold air. Um, so essentially what I'm saying here is that you need to find out who is my customer? Can I sort of uh, find a specific customer that would be the perfect beginning, the starting point? And can I uh, uh, manufacture and can I formulate my product in a way that it, um, it uh, addresses all the needs of this particular customer? This is hugely important. Don't worry about it. You'll have a lot of time to get to the other customers. The investors will be looking at, does this person, does this group understand what their customers want? Does it understand that the customer is not necessarily one stereotypical person, but it's actually a huge heterogeneous uh, you know, market of different uh, types of customers, different segments? Things like that are very important. And this leads to, uh, uh, there, there's been said a few things along the way, uh, a few uh, economical financial terms. I heard cash flow mentioned at one point and, and business model. I'm not even sure that uh, any of you know what a business model is at this point. And we'll definitely get to that, so don't worry about it. But I'll take this, uh, use this occasion to introduce another one that's very important if you're at least uh, from CBS or, or places like that, the value proposition. What value are you proposing to your customer? And this is just, this is something that you have to be so clear on. I have to be able to ask any of you, when, you've, when we've gotten to, let's say, week five or six of this course, I have to be able to point any of you uh, on the shoulder and say, what's your value proposition? And you would have, instantly, you would be able to come up with three or four sentences that perfectly describe your product and how it solves the problems of your customer, at least your first customer. So uh, be aware of that. That's another general term that's used. So how many customers do we have? This is kind of hard to figure out. Uh, for instance, I, I do a wind turbine that's supposed to stand on, on industrial buildings. Not a lot of people doing that uh, these days. So, so I, I, I kind of have to figure out uh, how do I figure out who many, uh, sorry, how many buildings are there and how many interested customers are there. And uh, you don't have the numbers uh, from the get-go, so you have to consult with, well, statistics, things like that. And uh, you have to see, okay, does anyone else sell to that same segment I'm looking at? Does anyone else provide, you know, maybe ventilators or whatever for these buildings? And by looking into their sales numbers, things like that, I could start getting a view of how many turbines can I actually sell into these segments. Um, and also, of course, it, it's very important there to, to, to think about the segments because one thing is to find a segment that's easily addressed. The other thing, of course, is finding a segment that actually has some potential to it. So it can actually, uh, so 
fortunately, there are a lot of students at the DTU, so that would be a good segment for me if I could get something that would be interesting to all the students at the DTU. So that would be a good starting point. And then going to CBS, I don't know how many students they have, but it's a pretty big place as well. So I hope you, you see my point there. And uh, of course, the last ping, uh, thing is, uh, is how do I get there? Um, because it, it was said earlier, I think uh, Mikkel said it uh, in a sort of a joking uh, fashion that in Silicon Valley, they look at three things, team, team, team. Uh, I think it was in 2010, I sat down at a dinner with uh, an investor from Silicon Valley. And he told me that he just invested in this really interesting uh, company. And I said, wow, that sounds so good. What, what was it? I have no idea, he said. That, how does that work? Well, I actually don't know exactly what they're doing, but the guy doing it, he's really good. So that's why I invested. So, so it, it, and, and make no mistake, this whole thing about the group forming and, and having all the competencies present and being you know, aware of what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and what do we need to uh, proceed and what do we need to succeed, that's so important to the investors. So uh, take a note of that. Um, and also, what are the barriers? Uh, I'm taking these a bit out of order. I apologize for that. I'm just kind of speaking as I remember them. Um, the main barriers you, you'll be facing, uh, and again, I have to take up this, this whole thing about the team because you can stand in front of an investor and say, we see these five barriers and we will be handling those barriers in this way. And the investor, provided it's a, you know, a well-informed and, um, and experienced investor, will, will be thinking, yeah, that's all very good. It's nice that you're showing me that you can handle these barriers and that you've identified these barriers. But he actually also, at the same time, he's perfectly aware of the fact that these are not going to be the barriers that will bring down your company. What will bring down your company somewhere along the way is something you haven't th thought of uh, at this point. And what's important then, of course, at that point, what's important is that you have a team that you believe in that you believe is actually able to handle these barriers as they emerge. And by exemplifying that, showing that you have these example barriers, you show also that you have a team and a, you know, a process, a logic that's able to handle barriers as they emerge. Um, of course, this uh, touches upon the competencies needed, uh, so I won't get more into that. I think a very important point here is that uh, there's actually a lot of competencies to be found out there. Of course, you have consultants. You can always put that in there. That's perfectly valid. If you have an investor presentation and you say, well, I'm not that good at the whole you know, uh, structural engineering part. I need someone else to do the calculations. It's perfectly valid to say, I there's this great Danish company or British company or whatever who will be doing that part for us. So we don't have to have that in our group. But at least we have someone we know could do it. Uh, that's one thing, but also, and that's something that refers very much to the work of, of Tom, uh, Tom here, is that there's a lot of competencies to be found in the cloud. If you look at uh, websites such as Kickstarter, um, we uh, mentioned uh, Podio earlier. I don't think Podio actually matches you to other competencies, but, but try to see what's out there, because there's a huge movement going on in uh, you know, open design and the possibility of actually sourcing development and design processes on, uh, on uh, the internet and, and somewhere else. And, and people are very much willing to, to help you in that. So if you're willing to look into that, that'll also be a very, very interesting dimension to, well, that would be definitely a novel dimension to that project and something that we would also like to follow very, uh, very, uh, very closely. Of course, at some point you get to the bottom line. How much do you need? Um, that's, that's what happens, and, and, and there's no way around it. At some point during this course, you will have to do some financial planning, and you might as well get used to it. And hopefully, hopefully you're all, you know, uh, you'll have sort of the, the, the entrepreneur's uh, mindset at the end of this course. That's, that's, my, that's my, my deepest hope. And at that point, you will also have realized that, you know, and I, I have to know what an ROI is. I have to know what an internal rate of returners, I have to know what the payback time is, all that stuff, all those strange terms, you'll probably have to look into that at least uh, when standing in front of the investor because that's the language they'll be speaking. 
and luckily it's not more than that. It's, it's, it's pretty much a language and it's not necessarily something that will require you to go through deep philosophical uh, you know, uh, <laughs> processes. Um, and at the end, you have to figure out how much do I need? And, and it's, it's like this with the, the investors and with the financiers that you don't get it all at, at once. At least in Denmark, it's, it's a bit more you know, flexible in, for instance, the US and in the UK. But in Denmark, you get enough money to go, to go just a little bit further, just a little bit further. And then, then, they'll, then they'll say, then you can come back. Then we can talk again and see if you can get money for the next, next part of the process. And it actually relates quite well to your stage gate model, the one you, you mentioned earlier, because you could actually look at these gates as an investor meeting. And that's, that's what, what my life is all about when I'm working in Edgeflow, is essentially, what do I need to do? And that's the execution dimension of this. What do I need to do for the ne next investor meeting to become a success? Initially, I have to show that the concept works, that uh, get a proof of concept established. Okay, that, then I have that in place. Then I have to go on. Then I have to um, show the investor that the market is there. I have to validate the market. I have to talk to customers. I have to get letters of intent, things like that. More money. Then I have to go into, okay, how do I scale this? I have to show the production is working, things like that. So it, it's, it's a phase thing. And, and you just, you have to be ready uh, for working as an entrepreneur because the entrepreneur is uh, chronically underfinanced. You will never have enough money. So you have to prioritize your, uh, the, the funds you have very, very sort of strictly because you'll never have enough money to do everything. You'll have to do what's, what's necessary. And you don't have enough money to do it uh, incorrectly the first time. So get it right the first time. <laughs> That's also, I guess, what this course is about. Um, I don't think I have too much else. I, uh, just uh, just to, uh, to get you uh, to, to make a, an example of this, I have my company Edgeflow. If I went through this, this is something that sort of goes on in my head all the time, as I said earlier. Uh, I'm not sure I would have proceeded with my company if I had had, had that you know, mindset at that point because it's, it's a pretty complex thing I'm, I'm, I'm venturing into. Fortunately, I did it anyway, so I'm, I'm glad of that. So you don't have to meet all the requirements, but you'll never find the perfect, uh, the perfect, uh, uh, the perfect idea. Uh, just also, if you really believe in idea, an idea, that's actually something that also comes across to the investor because they know that you'll be doing everything in your power to realize that idea, and that's a very important uh, dimension as well because that means then. Push comes to shove, you'll be there and you'll, uh, you'll do what's necessary. So. Cheers, Jacob. Cheers. So once you've done your, uh, your first stage, which is the uh, uh, discover phase, generated as many opportunities as you can, hopefully use uh, Jacob's quick and dirty method, filter out some of the, the, the crappy opportunities which are never going to lead anywhere, so you can focus on specific ones that might actually interest the investors, uh, work well at the uh, stage gate meetings, this type of thing. Um, one thing that it will be very important for you to do is, I'm not suggesting you need a, a team leader and the team leader role won't get any extra points in any way, um, but it's useful to have somebody to administer the project in some way. So you've got very precious meetings now on Fridays where you get together one time a week hopefully you'll do it a bit in the evenings as well but you need to make those meetings count you haven't got a very long time scale here so it should be clear objectives when you come in to the meeting on the friday okay what phase are we at now are we in the discover phase in which case we need to be diverging and creating as many ideas as possible and what goal do you want to hit at the end of this session then the next week it may be a convergent phase then the next week, it may be on to, uh, following on from this, uh, the definition of the opportunity and problem. So I would suggest you need to be able to define your problem in one sentence, in three sentences, in a page, uh, in an entire report. That's how it works. When I produced my thesis for my uh, uh, PhD, that was the same thing. If you can't describe what you're doing in one sentence, in three sentences, in a page, 
you don't really know what you're doing. So just as a general rule of thumb, that's a good one to abide by. There's some other useful uh, tricks in terms of dealing with what, uh, narrowing down what problem you're dealing with. Use a verb and a noun combination. It basically breaks the problem down into the simplest form or uh, the business proposition anyway. Um, and the whole process should lead you to a project mission statement. So once you've uh, come up with all your business opportunities, you've filtered out the ones you're not interested in, you should be able to produce a mission statement for what your company is going to deliver. And I think this is something uh, quite similar to the value proposition. So just as a quick example, uh, here's some example problem definitions. The first one, uh, secondary school students have a hard time understanding the contract concept of centripetal force. So would we say that is a, a good definition? One of the problems is that is suggested here, where is the spotlight? So it's pointing at the wrong thing. It's saying that the students have a hard time understanding it rather than the material is not understandable enough. So maybe it would be statement two, to design a mini merry-go-round uh, that the students will experience sense of petal force. But in this particular instance, what you've done is narrowed your solution space down. So when you go on to the next phase and you want to come up with lots of concepts, uh, you'll be narrowing it down to things which emulate a merry-go-round. So when you define your uh, problem, it should get to the heart of it, but not imply a solution if possible. So here's what we'd suggest would be a good example of a problem definition for this area. Teachers need an inexpensive device, uh, presently unavailable, to use in the classroom to enable students to experience and experiment with rotational motion and the forces involved. It's a bit of a mouthful, maybe it can be condensed a little bit more, but I think you get the picture. It gets to the heart of the problem and it doesn't narrow down the solution space. Um, I think we're running short on time here and I'll just skip over the, uh, the rest. Um, uh, there's some exercises there to help you think about problem definition and you should be able to use this presentation in your groups to go through the process during the course. You'll then have a development phase. Once you've got your problem definition, how many solutions can we propose? Lots of way th uh, thinking approaches for developing solution ideas. You'll have a whole lecture on it coming up uh, later on. There's also this scamper method which we'd propose. Uh, there's a website for it, really, uh, mindtools.com. Some really good advice about how to combine and develop and build on ideas. Um, this scamper, um, I, I don't know if you've used it before, but it's, it's teach quite widely across universities now. And then finally, the deliver phase, where you evaluate, select, and validate, uh, validate your designs and business concepts. So hopefully this is where we'll be building in the prototyping element uh, and testing element. Um, and then you finally are going to be launching. So what you need to think about now is if you're going to follow a process like this or along these lines, how does that fit on the timescales we're working on from now uh, to your midterm um, evaluation or analysis presentation to your final business pitch? Where are the key milestones you need to hit on the way? How are you going to structure your time? So you can use this process, you can use an alternative one, but you need to know how it fits to your time scales and make sure you know what you're doing at each Friday. Do we have any questions? Okay, just a couple of uh, quick requests for you by Friday. Uh, most of you haven't uh, registered your three business ideas yet. I suspect it might be a, uh, a late night in the pub on Thursday uh, trying to come up with them. Uh, but some of you have come up with some really good ones. I've, I've been having a look through so far. I'm really quite impressed. Uh, but it's very important. Uh, I'm taking the register of uh, these business ideas. So if you haven't come up with it, I'll know that you're not pulling your weight in your team. They don't have to be earth-shattering. 
There might be elements in your idea that are really useful and that are taken forward. But make sure you submit three business ideas that you can work on with your group on Friday. Um, also, I advise you fill in your Belbin test to uh, ease your discussion with your group on Friday. Um, and apart from that, do you have anything to add? Well, there's the other one. We may have to make sure that everyone has filled out the, uh, the group forming of course, yeah. As well. So I'd say when I looked last night, 80% of people had filled out the competencies uh, questionnaire. Um, if you're one of the 20%, just make sure you fill it in ASAP, please, so I can form the groups. Um, apart from that, I'll meet you in room 303A, uh, sorry, building 303A, room 44 at 1 o'clock. We'll have a small introductory, uh, um, well, a small introduction, then we'll move to 302, where we'll do the group work. Thanks very much. <laughs>